will be one of the people that helps make you viable and not wait for you to be viable to support. And that is how, and that is how we make change. Because change and movements come from the least likely places. They come from the least likely people that you think will deliver. The, the people who are least likely to succeed and be amplified in society. That is where change comes from. And when we have the audacity and the courage to forget all of the questions of the where did you go to school and do you have $100,000 and blah, blah, blah. And when we actually have the questions and say, do you want to make a change and make life for working people better? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm in. Woo! when no one else is talking about it. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you all so much for coming and being here today because it is these gatherings that not just propel the existing movement but also sow the seeds of future movements. I know that there are future city council members, future members of Congress here, future members of the U.S. Senate, future PTA members. It all matters. All of it matters. When we are all engaged in our communities, no matter how small the level, it really creates a conscientious self-governance. And that, I think, is what's important for us to realize and talk about as we go through these horrific hearings, as we see who's in the Senate and in, and in Congress and in the state. We are humans in the messy business of self-governance. That is what we are. If anything, it strips away all pretense of I went to this school or I came from that background. We are all in the business of governing ourselves. <laughs> and we're not here to say, and I, and I urge us all to reject the idea that you need some kind of pedigree that looks one specific kind of way or is the, or is the best or excels in one specific measure of success. Because when we actually draw from the diversity of experience, then we will self-govern much better. Mm. And we'll self-govern in accordance to our values. We won because we listened to people. Because we listened to their pain, we listened to their dreams, and we decided to advocate for it. We decided to advocate for it unapologetically and say in a modern, moral, and wealthy society, no person should be too poor to live. of humanity, how does it operate? For me, it means every person has health care regardless of their finances. Yes.
society, invest in our future, a moral society, and a moral generation will never leave a world to our children with rising sea levels, ever. A moral society will clean our air, clean our water, and guarantee those things for future generations to come. Mm. all the way there, but so long as there are people who believe in it, so long as there are people who show up for it, so long as there are people like you who give to it, we can make it happen. The, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That is me. We live in the society of today. It is a halfway point between the society of yesterday and the society of tomorrow. And when we have that, that when we are living in the society of today, we cannot drop our guard. Once you start speaking truth to power, that power comes for you. It comes for you. And I'm not here to mix it anything up. They're coming for us. They're coming for us from everywhere. They're coming for us from the right. They're coming for us from the tippy top. They're coming for us from everything because we done, we done let out a whole Pandora's box. Yeah. Yeah. Those two people who are here, who are in this room today, Tree is here, Raul is here, so many people are here that were in that little room upstairs when we had the audacity to think that we could pull this off, on June 26th we did, and then we elected Ayanna Presley. And we elect a cohort and a freshman class that is free from the influence of corporate and dark money. Yeah. Not only did we do that, but we also supported candidates that perhaps did not make it past the line this year, but will be making it past the line for years to come. Yeah. We supported people like Haniela Ng, who had the audacity to talk about things like the imperialist history of Hawaii. We had the audacity to support people like Abdul El Sayed, the governor in Michigan. single-payer health care. <laughs> yes, in the Midwest. And then Ilhan and Rashida proved it by getting elected. And mind you, these women were not elected in majority-minority districts, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> Ilhan Omar got elected in a district that was 70% white. And I think that's an important, uh, important thing to say. Because we and this platform is the one that builds bridges among all people for the advancement of all our dignity and all of our causes. Mm. And that's the only way that we push forward. There is so much cynicism out there. There is, in fact, I believe, a thirst to disbelieve in the power of elective office. There's a thirst for it because kind of like I often, when I'm talking to constituents, I often talk about, uh, about elected office and politics as relationships, because really they are the scaffolding of organized relationships. That is what politics is. That's what good politics is. And like relationships, when you are hurt over and over and over again, you don't want to believe in love anymore. You don't. That is the situation that we have in our governance. After being spurned over and over and over again, shortchanged on health care, shortchanged on criminal justice, shortchanged on education, there's a lot of folks who don't want to believe anymore. And that is why what we have accomplished is such an immense responsibility. It is a responsibility. Not just to deliver, because it doesn't mean that you get everything tomorrow as much as I would love that. I would love to get inaugurated January 3rd, January 4th, we're signing healthcare, we're signing this, we're decarcerating our society. But, but really, it is that we have a duty to always fight and maintain the strength of our values. 